Hi everybody, welcome to Found Flicks. On this Ending Explained, we will be looking at the newly released Cargo, where a father infected with a deadly virus has 48 hours to find a new home for his infant daughter. While Cargo is technically a zombie movie, it is much more of an emotional, slow burn, character-centric story that is heavier on atmosphere than gore and violence. And I quite enjoyed its unique take on the genre. So let's check out Cargo, breaking down everything you need to know about the story, explaining the ending, and theorizing on the unknown cause of the outbreak. Let's begin by looking more in depth at the monsters in the film. As you know, there are a lot of different kinds of zombie movies out there. Cargo's Undead being in a similar category to 28 Days Later, where they are not traditional zombies, but rather people infected by a virus which turns them into zombie-esque creatures. Those in Cargo display many of the same expected behaviors, like feasting on the flesh of other humans, along with slow and labored movements. These have a distinct look caused by the specific virus, and after becoming a dead, the victim's face is completely encrusted with a kind of slime, rather than the ghoulish look of typical zombies. They also oddly have a desire to dig holes and literally bury their heads in the ground, giving them the nickname of diggers. This is because they are specifically attracted to darkness and sleep in dark areas to hibernate or rest. An outbreak from this unknown virus causes a catastrophic global event. Our story picks up an indeterminate time after this initial outbreak, dropping us into the barren, beautiful outbacks of Australia, and the virus has even spread to this remote area, seeing dots of fires littering the landscape of aboriginal hunters who clean the land of the undead, along with a girl from their group Toomey running out on her own, who we learn more about in a bit. We then meet Andy, his wife Kay, and infant daughter Rosie taking a houseboat up the river to a military outpost and hopefully to some kind of more permanent safety. It seems the only reason they've survived this long is by staying as far out of major cities as possible, and here even avoiding dry land. Even without any immediate danger in the area, you can feel it in the innate tension in the interaction Andy has with a the family they happen across. He warmly calls out hello to the man, but Dad doesn't look so happy with his introduction going for a gun, sending Andy back inside. Unfortunately, their food supplies are running low, and while Kay and Andy do have a loving, healthy relationship, they strongly disagree on their next course of action, though both are coming from the same place of concern over their daughter's survival. They have some luck a bit further down the river, coming across a half-sunken boat that Andy discovers is full of food, but it appears he's not alone, hearing a rattling coming from a closet but he is unabated, bringing the food back and surprising Kay with it by goofily attaching a can of food to a fishing line. Impressively, he found three to four months worth of food and their dire situation has been put on hold. He even found a bottle of wine that he leaves for Kay to discover along with a note wishing her happy anniversary. Oh, well isn't that sweet? And Kay, potentially feeling guilty for not getting Andy anything, heads back to the boat having no reason to be worried as Andy told her specifically that it was safe, then hearing the same creaking from the closet, sending Kay running out. But she gets caught right at the edge, getting dragged back inside and screaming out. I could see why people would think she was dumb for heading back to the boat. But again, Andy told her it was safe to not worry her. So it's kind of on him for lying to her, even if it was because he was trying to protect her and he also didn't have any reason to suspect she'd go back to the boat either. She's found by Andy in the bathroom, futilely tending to a bite wound on her leg. He doesn't want to believe it, but she has been infected by the bite, and that already isn't looking so good. And here we get an interesting detail when trying to consider the bigger story. Andy retrieves a first aid kind of kit to deal with the infected, including an airline style pamphlet describing the virus's effects, a wrist timer set for 48 hours, the time it takes for the virus to turn them undead, and a mighty big suicide syringe. Perhaps in most cases it would be better to end the infected's lives before they turn completely. But it's odd to consider the idea of the government producing these, but they became aware of the infection and how it spreads enough to at least create these kits. And through Kay, as her time ticks by, we get to see these symptoms come to fruition firsthand. Seen convulsing and coughing up blood, and later her leg wound starts to produce a viscous slime. She knows her change is inevitable, and finds a moment of peace sitting at a tree, the perfect time to let go. But Andy refuses to give up hope, painfully dragging her back into the truck in search of a hospital nearby he saw on the map. They still have time to keep her alive, but if she bleeds out, the change will come quicker. Coming across an infected guy standing in the road, Andy swerves erratically to avoid him, crashing the car into a tree and a branch impaling Kay. Andy blocks out, coming to, looking over to Kay, not moving, facing away. She quickly animates, her face and eyes covered in the same slimy substance coming from her wound, now caked over 
Amber and Hardened, looking like snotty Amber, and she attacks Andy, biting him on the arm. The reason she turns so quickly is she bled out and died due to the tree's injury, speeding up the process. And with no other choice, Andy puts Kay down with one of those big ass needles, falling to the ground in anguish. Not only did he fail to save his wife, but now he is infected as well, and only has 48 hours to find a safe place for his daughter in this seemingly impossible post-apocalyptic scenario. He elects to continue with his previous destination of the hospital, at one point stopping when Rosie is upset, calming her down by spraying some of her mother's perfume. Soon they find they are not alone, as an infected man shambles into the area with a bone in his mouth. The same girl Toomey rushes in, begging for Andy not to hurt her dad, cutting her hand and luring him away with the blood. Her dad was also the same man earlier in the road that caused them to crash, making their stories coincidentally tragically intertwined. If she hadn't been keeping her zombie dad alive, he wouldn't have been in the road. But it doesn't do much good to focus on that kind of cause and effect at this point. Andy then makes it to the village he was hoping would help Kay, looking much more ramshackle and smaller than he expected. And when checking out the quote unquote hospital, it's obvious that it wouldn't have done much for delaying Kay's death, realizing his plan to get her here was ultimately pointless. Though he meets a nice woman, Etta, who was a teacher at the school in town, learning that her class was comprised of Aboriginal students. Among the students was of course Toomey, recounting that all of the Aboriginal in the area were somehow aware that something bad was coming, and quickly abandoned their modern lifestyles, returning to living on the land like their ancestors. And according to Etta, if he is looking for the safest place for his daughter, they are the people to find. We learn that Toomey has run away from the group since her father turned, hiding out in the wilderness and protecting him, feeding him whatever animals she can find. Because she knows that if the group finds out about him, they will kill him. She can't bear to let go of her father. And according to the powers of the mystical clever man amongst their group, there is a way that his magic medicine can fix her dad, teasing us with this idea of a potential cure. This sudden introduction of magic doesn't seem to quite gel with the very grounded world we've been presented with so far. And this concept is barely developed further beyond this initial idea. Toomey then remembers back to a fonder time with her father. There, the clever man giving us a little more insight as to what the story is really about. Hint, it's not the zombies. Saying that man is poisoning the land, and as it becomes sick, in turn, so do we. So, you know, the people destroying nature and all that, they're really the bad ones. Got it? And this point is really hammered home with the next survivor Andy encounters, the vile, despicable Vic. Making his way to that military outpost, it looks like this isn't going to be much help for Andy either, seeing several uniformed diggers with their heads buried underground. So once again, his plan has been for nothing, though he's initially given some hope when encountering Vic, offering him refuge at his palace of gas, housed within a couple of shipping containers where he keeps keeps his so-called girlfriend Lorraine. Surprise, she's not really his girlfriend, but being forced by Vic into being his live-in love slave. But it's made especially obvious he's an awful person when he takes Andy out to hunt the infected, bringing him to a cage where they are all gathered, picking them off one by one, and then looting their bodies for jewelry and valuables. And a chained up Toomey is in the cage, Vic using her as bait to bring the undead here. So he's a scumbag to the bone and doesn't value other humans' lives over his own personal gain. After witnessing this, Andy is deeply affected, heading off on his own to do himself in with the big syringe, though he is unable to follow through, knowing that Rosie truly isn't safe in the care of this madman. And Lorraine appears begging him not to do it, and she is more than happy to take care of Rosie, but can't do it here. Right on cue, Vic shows up noting the cozy scene, accusing Andy of trying to steal his girl, knocking him unconscious with his rifle. He wakes up in the cage as bait, along with Toomey, the two chained together. And that bastard Vic even looted his wedding ring. Andy apologizes to the girl and offers to work together to get out. But she has her own interest, wanting the key to the clever man's cage who was also captured. They agree and better figure out something quick to escape, as Toomey says the ghost can smell her and will be here soon. Andy devises a gruesomely clever plan, rounding up some body parts and bits into a lump on the end of a chain, tossing it out from the cage like a disgusting fishing line. And it works! All the undead are attracted to it, pulling on the chain which lifts the side of the cage enough for Andy to get out. And after a few more tries, gets to me out too, heading back to Vic's hideout rounding up everybody and sneakily yoinking his keys while Vic is fast asleep. He does finally wake up after they nearly make it to freedom, and in the process of confronting them, accidentally shoots Lorraine when she steps out to calm him down. But I gotta say, he had plenty of time to not fire. It was a really long time before she stepped out, and he's like, hmm, what? Oh, who's that? Whoopsies! That night while sleeping, we see Andy is losing himself to the symptoms as time ticks by, finding him rubbing his face on a rock. His 
his time is obviously running out, as well as his options, so he decides he wants to get back to the river, while Toomey still wants to find the clever man to save her father with his magic. But Andy tells her there's no fixing what he and her dad have, and lots of other smart people have tried. Again, giving us a tiny clue to the bigger scope of the story. The scientists sometime after the initial outbreak tried to find a cure, but it seems to no avail so far. Toomey runs off to check on her father, finding his shirt hung up on a tree, his body buried inside. Her family's group of hunters finally found her dad and, as expected, killed him. And in their culture, they bury the dead within a tree so the ghost cannot wake them. After mourning for her father, Toomey agrees to guide them to the river. Andy's final desperate plan is to return to the family that he saw there earlier, since they seem safe and happy. But unsurprisingly, this didn't last. Coming across dear old dad digging a hole big enough for his entire family, we see that he's been bitten. And apparently, since he promised he would never leave them, he decides it would be best to murder them all and then himself. And once again, Andy's journey has only brought him back to death, as this family is obviously no longer an option for safety. Surprisingly, Andy does nothing to stop this, since his journey isn't yet complete. And yet, after the man follows through with his terrible plan, Andy goes to retrieve the gun, earlier being told there would be two bullets left, and considers doing the unthinkable, made even more heartbreaking hearing Rosie for the first time call out for daddy. But salvation is closer than he realizes, Toomey saying she wants to return to her people, knowing they are nearby due to the fires they set when hunting. After crossing a bridge, they enter into an ominous dark train tunnel. Inside, several infected people line the areas with their heads on the walls as Andy had been doing earlier. And according to Toomey, they are hibernating and need the dark. Oh, and guess who randomly happens to be on the other end of the tunnel? Their old pal Vic. Andy calls his name, leading him away, blending in with the other undead on the wall. Vic goes down the line one by one, taking each of their heads off with a hammer as Andy gets the gun ready. When Vic comes to him, he fires, the two getting into a struggle. Then another gunshot goes off, and it appears that Vic is victorious getting up and walking over to the truck, dragging Toomey out and pummeling her. Andy isn't down and out yet, even if he was shot, pulling himself to his feet, finding Vic holding Rosie. Andy asks for her back, but Vic says he took something of his, so he should be able to take something of his. But Andy argues that Lorraine wasn't really his in the first place, and he is the one that shot her and everything after all. Vic breaks down into tears, unable to kill the infant, and Andy grabs the baby and wounded Toomey, leaving Vic on his own to weep. Toomey got pretty messed up by Vic too, and is unable to walk on her own. Soon he has another attack, his eyes growing encrusted, looking over at a delicious pile of flesh nearby. But glancing over at Rosie brings him back to himself, grabbing the meat for another purpose. Getting closer to the hunting party and thusly several of the undead they are taking out, he collapses, retrieving the bits and tying it to a branch. Then, knowing this is the end, says his goodbye to Rosie, telling her Toomey will take care of her now. As his eyes grow blurry, and he begins to instinctively dig into the darkness. And Toomey puts Rosie back on him, inserting a bite guard in his mouth. Nearby, the kill squad is finishing up cleaning the area, hearing a bird chirp call from Toomey out in the fog. The three emerge, Rosie and Toomey on Andy's back, riding him like a demented horse or something, now turned by the virus, but being led by the meat on the stick to get them back to the group since Toomey can't walk. And this has the additional benefit of protection from the undead, as they can only smell Andy and not the girls. Smart thinking, Andy, even though it's really bizarre looking. About to strike Andy through, Toomey stops the hunter, giving him a final happy memory to hang on to, spraying his wife's perfume one last time which he still appears to recognize. Toomey then clutches his hand and he is killed. The two return to the others of the group, and fortunately it appears that Andy did succeed despite dying. Even though it's sad that he couldn't escape his inevitable fate, at least he finally got Rosie to safety. As the teacher mentioned earlier, being with them is the safest place for Rosie. And as we saw, Andy's encounters meeting other survivors and potential safety always ended up in death and disaster. And at least he is now at peace, buried in a tree of his own. And his daughter has a new home, which is all he was striving to find in the first place. A bittersweet, yet still hopeful ending. As far as the lingering question as to what is behind the release of the virus, Based on a few references and sightings in the movie, including Toomey's father working for the same company, I'd wager that it's related to fracking going on in the area. This mining process uses liquid to bore holes deep underground to extract oil and gas, and this unnatural man-made drilling is upsetting the earth itself, tying back to what the clever man said about how man is poisoning the earth 
resulting in man becoming sick as well. So some of the gas released from the increasingly poisoned earth could have contained this particular virus. Mixing with the air would allow the virus to quickly spread, and from there it would continue to spread further as those infected bit others. Also taking into consideration that an obviously important element to the story is about leaving the native aboriginals to themselves, and the importance of leaving their land in its natural state as well. Harkening to real life development, including fracking taking over these kinds of areas, and essentially destroying them. So because of all this, it makes sense that it was disrupting nature itself that caused the virus to initially manifest and spread, due to man's greed and desire for development. With that, we have come to the conclusion of this ending explained on Cargo. Hey, don't forget to send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by messaging me on social media at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Cargo and its ending? Were you hoping Andy would somehow find a cure? And what do you think about a sequel? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.